Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 25, September 6th through September 12th, 1861. Before we get started, I just want to say, hope everybody had a fantastic Labor Day weekend, and I also want to have a little bit of an announcement. We are going to post the next Patreon episode, uh, Patreon content. It will be a memoir review, and this time we are doing the very famous Company H uh, by Sam Watkins. It's one of those classics in terms of Civil War memoirs, so that will be hitting the Patreon feed for September shortly, so be on the lookout for that. I'm hoping it will be up there by the time this episode drops in between this week and next, so uh, once again, be on the lookout for that, and your contributions uh, toward the show are are very much welcome. I want to just say that in order to continue to provide a higher quality product, uh, it would be helpful uh, to at least break even in terms of some of these expenses for these sources. So um, shameless plea there for everybody. But once again, uh, anything is welcome, including uh, just your reviews and your ears. So let's go ahead and get into the episode this week. Last week, we talked about more action in Missouri, as well as the introduction for John C. Fremont. We talked about the strategic situation in Kentucky as well, closing with the taking of the town of Paducah by federal forces under Ulysses Grant. This week, we will begin to look back at West Virginia. And believe me, If you are shocked at all the time we are spending in West Virginia, uh, I was too when researching and didn't realize a lot of the early wars in the western part of Virginia, uh, but needless to say, here we are. When last we left things off in West Virginia, George B. McClellan had won several victories, which propelled him to take command in Washington, D.C., William S. Rosecrans, who was introduced in an earlier episode, had taken over command of McClellan's Department of the Ohio. The Confederates were not willing to give up on the western part of Virginia just yet, though. They would mount a move to retake the Lost Territory and move on the Canal River Valley, which is in southern West Virginia. Around 2,000 men would advance across the Gauley River and engage a small Union force, defeating them easily. The Union force facing the Confederates was only a single regiment of Ohio infantry. This small skirmish would be known as the Battle of Kessler's Cross Lanes. The 7th Ohio, the Ohio infantry regiment engaged by the rebels, had recently seized a large amount of money for the eventual government of West Virginia. Fun fact, the 7th were known as the Roosters, possibly because they had a lieutenant colonel who squawked like a rooster to get his men riled up. The 7th would be overwhelmed by the Confederates, but they would put up a bit of a fight. The battle was known as the Battle of Forks and Knives, because some of the Ohioans were eating when beset by Southerners. After the victory, the Confederates would advance further, but fall back, fearing overextension, digging in in a place called Carnifex Ferry. Carnifex Ferry is around an hour and 15 minutes driving from Charleston, West Virginia, just for context. These southern forces would be commanded by co-commanders John Floyd and Henry Wise. Both men are worth mentioning, although the name John Floyd 
should sound at least a little bit familiar. Floyd would serve as governor of Virginia, much like his father, also named John Floyd. During his time in office, he commissioned a monument to George Washington. That monument still stands on the Capitol grounds in Richmond today. Floyd would serve as the Secretary of War under Buchanan, but would not make grand splashes in that role, being subpar in performance. What he did do well, though, was prepare the South for a potential war. Before the election of Abraham Lincoln, Floyd had been against secession. After the election, he would seemingly do all in his power to aid the Southern cause. This included scattering the few federal forces as mentioned previously. He also had done much in terms of stocking arsenals in southern states. We know that he tried to get Robert Anderson to abandon Charleston Harbor. Remember the letters that were sent and how Robert Anderson found a loophole in the letter that was going to be coming from the War Department and the Secretary of War, who was John Floyd. After the war broke out, he would become a general in the Confederate Army. Henry Wise had also been a governor of Virginia, as well as a congressman from that state. Wise played a part in the story of John Brown, who could have commuted his sentence and could uh, have been declared insane, although Wise did not think this to be the case. So that was the governor of Virginia who this appeal went to. Governor Wise did praise Brown in a weird twist, but still insisted on his execution, and more specifically, that his execution be held in Virginia. And now that is also sort of a controversy that we talked about in the early episodes, that Wise wants this execution to happen in Virginia, which... Maybe not the wisest of decisions, simply because it is a southern state, it is a slaveholding state, and this does not go over well for abolitionists and the supporters of John Brown, who are seeing him uh, be put to death in uh, southern soil, right? Um, So that is sort of a curious decision, whereas John Brown could have been sent somewhere else. He was after all, rebelling against the federal government, so could have been not in Virginia, could have been in a northern state. Much like Floyd, Wise would join the army after secession. As a quick note, commanding a regiment facing the Confederates is one Rutherford B. Hayes. If that name sounds familiar, and I think it should from our grade school history classes, Hayes is going to be a future president of the United States. Hayes was born in 1822 in Ohio and practiced law before the war. He had been a Whig before switching to the newly formed Republican Party in the 1850s. During the conflict, he will rise to the rank of general, serving in the East and the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864. After the war, obviously, he will go into politics, eventually becoming the governor of Ohio, before being elected the 19th president of the United States. Additionally, future president William McKinley is serving as an enlisted man in the same regiment. Future generals on the Union side, McCook and Liedel, as well as future Confederate generals, Gabriel Wharton and Henry Heath, are also present at the Battle of Carnifex Ferry. Floyd would have his force of Confederates 
dig in around the Henry Patterson farm there at the ferry, prepared for a Union counterattack. Rosecrans would move on the Confederate earthworks, eager to expel the Confederates from Western Virginia once again. Three brigades of Federals, numbering around 7,000 men, would advance on September 10th and assault the works. They would have little success, as a flanking attempt was foiled by the concealed rebels. Additionally, Rosecrans would deploy his men piecemeal, that is, the units would advance one at a time toward the earthworks. Here is an account from a Virginian of the battle. On the morning of the 10th, in obedience to orders from Brigadier General Floyd, I moved my regiment from our temporary camp, which was about one mile in advance of the main camp at Gali, and took post in the center of the line of log breastworks and on the left of the earthworks and the battery of four guns. The regiment formed in line behind the breastworks at 2.30 p.m., within a few minutes after I was informed of the rapid approach of the enemy. At 3 p.m., a heavy column moved forward to attack us, which was gallantly repulsed by the right wing after a sharp exchange of fire lasting about 25 minutes. The enemy then taking shelter behind some houses and haystacks beyond the range of our fire, and from which position they continued to fire on us with the infield rifles. At 3.30 p.m., the enemy, having placed their artillery in position, opened fire upon my line, a terrific fire of shells, grape, shrapnel, round shot, and with a rifle cannon, which was continued with little intermission until 5 p.m. At about 5 p.m., a heavy column, supposed to be an entire brigade, advanced to assault our center. Our fire was reserved until the enemy approached to within 100 yards, when a well-directed fire from our whole line checked their advance. After a contest of 45 minutes, the enemy, notwithstanding the efforts of the officers to rally them, broke and ran. About 6 p.m., a third attempt was made to force our center, which met with the same result at the preceding. Our regiment awaiting the approach coolly and routing them completely. In the early part of the battle, the fire of the enemy's artillery was high. They attempted to enfilade my line, which they failed to do in consequence of their guns being disabled by the fire from the battery in the earthwork. At 7.10, the firing ceased and the enemy retired from the field. So we have a couple things that we can analyze from this pretty long quote here that are relevant to us, right? So we talked about inflating fire and how they're trying to fire down the line of rebels. This is a common tactic and one that we obviously talked about in a previous episode in our tactics episode. We also have a good idea and it also really helps with this time frame going that the Union is attacking sort of piecemeal. There is not one concentrated assault, right? Uh, so this account does a good job of outlining that for us. Casualties were lopsided as the North suffered some 158 compared to 30 Confederates. Despite the success in fighting off the attackers and the assaults by the Federal forces, Rosecrans was still able to move his artillery to high ground. From that position, they would be a problem for the southern forces. So they probably could actually be a lot more devastating than was described in our quote here. Floyd would retreat back across the river instead of being pounded by the Yankees. A renewed assault the next day with forces that still outnumbered Floyd's, as well as this superiority in artillery, would prove to be a disaster. The next day would see the Confederate escape, 
Carnifex Ferry was labeled a Confederate defeat as they had been forced from the Kanawha Valley and were now being pursued by Rosecrans and his larger Union force. Floyd would develop a personal rivalry with Wise. I like to think it is because they were both former governors, but it very well could have been anyone would have been in Floyd's crosshairs. He would blame the defeat on Wise, peculiar considering Wise had warned him about the Union forces and the fact that his position was not a good one. Even more peculiar considering Wise was not actually present at Carnifex Ferry. But I suppose the complaint was that Wise had not given reinforcements, so that is why it was all his fault. Funny how that works sometimes. Floyd would still write to Jefferson Davis about how his army was delivered from the clutches of Rosecrans after the battle and generally talk about how great he was. The rivalry would continue, and not even the commander of the Virginia State Troops, Robert E. Lee, would be able to sort it out. Let's pop back into Kentucky for just a smidge. I know we started to talk a little bit about the strategic situation, but I wanted to delve just a little bit deeper into the pivotal border state. Why exactly was Kentucky so important? Well, as we have already mentioned, Kentucky was the original home of both Abraham Lincoln as well as Jefferson Davis. There were strong ties to the North, but also the South. Economic connections with northern states applied much as it did with other border slave states. Many native Kentuckians originated from Virginia. So there were parts of both worlds in the state. To make things more confusing, the state guard sided with the south, while the home guard sided with the north. Different militia units had popped up all over the place. Also important was that in Kentucky, farmers had turned toward livestock raising. Horses and beef would be commodities that both sides would wish to capitalize on. Kentucky, as mentioned, was the state of compromise. This mixed identity perhaps had developed long before the war coming to the same realization that other states did, that they would be battleground for two armies, Kentucky had declared neutrality. In 1861, there had been already a larger-scale battle in Missouri and Virginia, so the example was clear for the Bluegrass state that they would be next. But alas, they would not be able to Switzerland out the war, as we will see. To illustrate the divide even further, a conference of several prominent Kentucky politicians, including Crittenden, the Southern sympathizing governor, Beriah McGuffin, and John C. Breckinridge, came together to figure things out. They could not come to a real conclusion because of being split down the middle. So, there was a Mexican standoff between the Confederate and Union forces. They would both be ready to jump into Kentucky. The Confederates failed in securing support from Kentucky when forces under Leonidas Polk occupied strategic positions on the river, as mentioned. Leonidas Polk is an interesting figure. Born into a wealthy family in 1806, Polk would attend West Point and become a friend to Jefferson Davis during their time there. Leonidas would leave the army and become not only a wealthy landowner in Tennessee, but also an Episcopal bishop. He would be a founding member of the University of the South, known today as Sewanee. Polk was surprised by the new provisional president of the Confederacy to receive a commission as a general in the Confederate Army. In 
he had not been in the military since 1827 and saw no action. Still, Polk would join the cause and become a commander of rebel troops. Later in the war, he would become the victim of a targeted artillery strike, but we will get there in 2024. Under the command of Polk was one Gideon Pello. It would be Pello's men who seized the key high ground overlooking the river at Columbus, and it would also be Pello's men who faced off against Ulysses Grant and his forces in his first battle of the war. Grant may have been familiar with the older general. Pello had served in the Mexican-American War, having been a native of Tennessee and under the patronage of President Polk, who named Pello a general. Pello would be wounded twice in engagements during the conflict, but is probably better known for a quarrel with our old friend Winfield Scott. Scott, being arrogant, as you remember, demanded that Pello rewrite some after-battle reports that named the Tennessee general as playing a larger part in some of Scott's victories than he actually had. It would be resolved eventually, but needless to say, Scott did not care for Pello thereafter. Pello would be a supporter of Stephen Douglas during the 1860 election, and at the outbreak of the Civil War, would be named the overall commander from his home state by Governor Isham G. Harris. Anyway, because Polk ordered Pello to move into Kentucky, the state would officially side with the Union. Not only that, but they would call for the removal of the Confederate troops from the areas of the state. Kentucky would call upon the Union Army for support in expelling the invaders. Governor McGuffin would try to blame both sides for their aggression, citing Grant moving into Paducah as well as Polk. This did not work. The flag of the Union would be raised at the state capitol. A separate secessionist governor would be set up later in Kentucky in 1861. Skirmishing would soon begin in the state, but 1862 would see Kentucky truly turn into a battleground, something many had worked to avoid. We will close out today with a brief rundown of Sally Tompkins. Sally received a captain's commission in the Confederate Army. It is believed that she was the only woman to have done this in the Confederate States, and maybe even the first woman in history to receive such a commission. She was born in 1833 in the Tidewater region of Virginia. Sally moved from near Norfolk to Richmond as a young woman in 1854. Even before the move, she proved to be a natural caregiver in her community. We have mentioned that after First Bull Run, the city would be transformed as a center to care for wounded soldiers. Sally would begin to aid the wounded at the home of Judge John Robertson. Along with several other ladies belonging to an Episcopal church, they would become quite an effective hospital for the incoming wounded. Jefferson Davis would declare that the hospital needed to be under military command, thus Sally would receive a commission as a captain in the Confederate Army. She accepted on September 9th, but she would decline the pay. While running the hospital, it was necessary to hire a blockade runner to procure supplies for the suffering men. Sally would continue to operate the hospital throughout the war. Her patients affectionately knew her as Captain Sally. After the war, she was known as the Angel of the Confederacy. She would remain a local hero in Richmond until her death in 1916. So that seems like a good place to pause. We went back to West Virginia yet again. Missouri and West Virginia are probably not what you think of when theaters of the Civil War pop up. 
but here we are having spent a lot of time and we will continue to spend time there just as a little spoiler we talked about the important battle of carnifex ferry we also stopped back in to talk about kentucky lastly we introduced sally tompkins and her importance to the war next week robert e lee will try to turn things around for the confederates in west virginia we will stay in kentucky as well for the first battle on their soil. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to our website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show would be greatly appreciated. And once again, be on the lookout for the next Patreon episode, which hopefully will be coming up shortly feedback is appreciated any kind of questions comments concerns the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com thank you all so much for listening and have a great week